Uh, one of the things that struck me in looking at the memos uh, that OMB has put together on this and the policy coming out is that it, 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 it seems to be one of those fairly rare and remarkable times when what many people think of as a common sense approach to organizing policy actually emerges and thinking about how do you integrate all of these fragmented silo uh, activities and policies of the federal government so that they come together and really have an effect. Could you give us a little bit of the flavor of how this emerged within the administration? Because we know that there are always um, uh, trade-offs, different priorities, and people are wondering, yeah, they might agree, it's a great idea to integrate, uh, to try to focus on places, but we know from past experience that you can waste a lot of time doing that and maybe better just to focus on uh, the immediate uh, impact you can have in, in different specific areas. Um, where did the leadership come from? How did the, the, the conversation uh, develop? What were the trade-offs that we're seeing within the administration? How did this finally come about? Thanks for the question. I'll, I'll give you the, the brief version, obviously, because I know we want to have a chance for exchange on, on any number of things. And so many great points have been made. I've been writing them down. Um, the quick answer is that the, the ask was made by the White House Office of Urban Affairs, which was brand new. And in my view, uh, this would help give them a way of uh, operationalizing a fairly broad vision and a set of principles. That office had been established in executive order, I want to say February 2009, I think that's about right. It was something the president talked about in the campaign trail, in conversation with mayors, and county leaders, and others. So he established it by EO. The founding director and his team uh, approached me, and then we widened the circle a bit. But the, the starting place was, we want this administration to have a distinct vision, well articulated, um, of places. And that's why I mentioned human settlements early on, forgive, forgive the jargon, but places where people live and work, whether they're large or small. We don't want it limited to cities. We don't want this seen as an agenda that's limited to some parts of America, uh, no matter what their needs or strengths might be. This needs to be an inclusive vision. But we want to make sure that it includes, to your point, things like busting silos or working to integrate across functions. I would say there was another really important piece of DNA, if you will, that came up in particular in, in Jerry's comments, and that is a keen interest in being citizen-facing. Uh, so Raphael talked about important user groups within government or within our system, sometimes they're cross-sector, and he, uh, I think, put it nicely. We were interested, too, I'm not saying we got all the way there, but we were interested in the sorts of things Jerry uh, brought up about, to put it in the Napa-esque way, co-production with citizens. Uh, when the public is helping you to achieve things because they have greater awareness. You've pushed out data, hopefully you've done it in usable ways or you've made it available and the private sector has, within 15 minutes, created an iPhone app to use your data and make profit on it, but you know that's fine if that helps it get to, to people. Um, so being citizen-facing, um, being accessible to the public and legible to the public, was a part of the DNA, but I would say even more than that was the cross-functional integration, being less siloed in the way we approached places. Urban Affairs made the ask. Uh, the memo itself uh, had several signatories, the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, Peter Orzag was director of OMB at the time. Um, and really, from there, it has struck a wider set of chords in a way that we think is fantastic, whether or not we initially envisioned it. So I, I love that the conversation has come to include everything from military operations, civilian emergencies, other sorts of things we, we could sort of dimly view and we saw our relationships, but we were fundamentally starting with, we could respond to places where people live and work as a big fragmented federal government in more nimble ways. And we need to be intentional about that and we need to lay out a bit of a roadmap uh, for how this administration wants to approach it. Thank you. Let me ask if there are panels. Yeah, go ahead. So, not necessarily a question, John, but, uh, John, but more of a, a plea. Um, two things. Um, I think um, uh, to build on something Jerry said already, the, the notion that there would be one geospatial thing in federal government, I think, is a mistake. So, 
you know, a, a building off of the original memo to make a, a more comprehensive strategy that, that places just ingrained in our daily, you know, function, I think is extraordinarily important. We need to rethink how we deal with geospatial and federal government. And a single one, I think, would be a mistake. Um, second one is the, the, the place I would start is, is map the budget. Let, let's put where we spend all of our dollars on a map. And, and um, um, I think that fits really, really well in the day one administration goal of transparency. This whole notion of, well, if we want to have a, a lively, sort of, you know, real discussion about budget, let's actually put it on a map and make sure it's transparent. Just quick response that that was the vision, by the way, behind USAspending.gov. But have a ways to go, and there's yeah. some really interesting questions it raises about how money flows, exactly. not just to places, but through contractors, and yeah. you know exactly what I mean. Anybody else? Yeah, um, I apologize that you're not able to necessarily hear my talk this morning, but uh, I'd like to catch up with you sometime. Um, one of the things I think would be um, really important in extending on the comment that you made is that this is all about cross-boundary, cross-border um, uh, intelligence and, and data sharing and decision making. And I recall when I worked uh, with the Vice President's Partnership for Reinventing Government, there was a, a tornado uh, Palm Sunday that knocked out a church, a whole bunch of parishioners. And the question that came was, how much of the United States is covered by no weather radio warning? They couldn't answer the question in terms of place. We had the number 90%, but what I found interesting was, with a great deal of sweat labor, we brought the missions of different agencies together, USGS, NOAA, and others, and we mapped that reality. The goal here should be making that seamless, instantaneous, and, and not complex. And I think, I, I commend you for the letter, because not one place in that letter did the phrase GIS or geospatial come up. And that's the way we need to look at this, is from a business intelligence point of view. And cross cross boundary sharing. Those are the things we need to enable. First um, I would like to announce um, that by agreement, by in depth discussion with the president's chief information officer, Vivek Quindra, some of the energy in this area and things that will be of particular interest to geo enablers and would be geo enablers and their users inside and outside of government we are going to push on the management side of OMB and through the e-government office, um, which not only has the official responsibility to sort of interact with and provide guidance for the Federal Geographic Data Committee, but is the home of how we get things done in government as opposed to what the policy goals are. Um, I see those boundaries, as you can imagine, as being artificial. They need to be blurred in a whole host of ways the budget side will remain closely involved. It's in conversation. I think that we can do good things. But we would like to take the very kind of roundtable discussion we're having this morning and operationalize it so that the federal government has uh, clearer goals, has interim milestones. Uh, it's been nicely said a number of different ways this morning. I'm feeling very deprived that I didn't play baseball as a kid, but uh, <laughs> singles, doubles works nicely. You know, in OMB over the last two years, we have not just talked about this kind of distinction, in other words, we have worked with agencies and pulled the plug on very large projects that promised home runs that continue to recede ever toward the horizon. Sometimes with difficult conversations. You've been at it for five or six or seven years. Nothing in particular has happened that has added value. We're not going to continue to sink dollars down that, that hole and had to make changes. And it ended up moving much toward what's a single or a double you could hit um, that we could talk with you and your congressional overseers and appropriators about. So that's, that's ahead. And I say this um, because we need to be working with you guys, Chris, and with this community and, and folks here on the panel to realize this. I do not think we can get very far at all if it is largely a conversation with the technologists about the frontier and, and what they can, that's a part of it. Um, they educate us, they teach us about imagining new uses, new things, and that's fantastic. But I think we need to be very demand driven, very purposeful. Um, and very much make you know and refine the business case as we go. 
this one follow sure. one follow up comment. This one, just a comment. Because <clears throat> we talk a lot about place and geospatial environments and renderings and a little bit of technology. It's really important to not lose sight of visualization. Um, you know, I think about my own my own son and my daughter, got an eighteen year old and eight year old, so not a great planner. Just a good, just a good plan. Um, but I, but I, when I look at them, they don't even read the way. They read. And the way that they type, and the way that they communicate, and the way that they understand is way. And I'm a very visual person. It's way more visual than I am. So to not lose sight, to understand, you know, well, there's a lot of dialogue about how we want to use this information. I'll go back to process. If you're going to look at process and you're going to look at how you make decisions and how you understand your decisions and the impact, it's really the visualization. It's not just the content itself. It's the discovery of the content, the consumability of the content, the actual use of the content, and how it's represented to people. Because people have to understand what they're looking at. Um, so I wouldn't lose sight. And too complicated, you're going to lose people. So we always try to make sure that that visualization aspect to uh, not just the decision makers, but any user is key to how we look at Can I just try to say I agree with that completely? How many people here have a watch on? So my guess is people who don't have their hands up, most of them are under 35. <laughs> yeah. Young people live differently, they process information differently, and we need to be in their space because that's where the future is. So thinking about how we do that and actually talking to them and making sure that they're in the mix in the conversation because that's the future of all of our decision making, particularly on the collective side. Um, and then the simplicity thing is, uh, is critically important as well. Um, we have you know, six, 60 data sets and thousands of fields and we don't find ways to have simple split second with things that capture people's attention uh, and understanding where we're, we're, we're doomed to not succeed. Rob Bell, technically I, I, I raised my hand when you asked who was asking a watch. I just want the record to show that my watch is actually off next to my iPhone, which is on the stop watch. That's the stop watch app. have the stop watch Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. for organizing this activity. When I uh, left the house this morning, my wife was out of town. I told my son that, you know, take care of things because I'll be at a, uh, a forum with Napa. Uh, he's a car enthusiast, so I have a semantic <laughs> definition of where I was heading this morning, but I'll talk to him about that this afternoon. Um, also, I'd like to say that, uh, like uh, the phrase, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV, uh, I'm not a federal employee or a manager in the federal government, but I spent 20 years in government before I left to assume a position with the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium. How many of you are familiar with the OGC? Just raise your hands for our mission. Okay, about half, a little more than half. Um, I, I think this is a really good compliment, and I thank the organizers for inviting me, because uh, from, from our mission in OGC, it's all about uh, the seamless and transparent integration of information in the decision cycle. The ability to be able to understand the somewhere and the some when in a very fluid, non-complex way. How do you, how do you, in that decision context, how do you bring information and technologies together uh, to, uh, to really address the question of where and when? Because the when is some. I don't think we talk too much about when today. But that's extremely important uh, for a number of different things. So our focus is to break down the silos that were talked about earlier. It is to put things in the context of place using open standards. And it's to reach across boundaries, whether they're policy boundaries or organizational boundaries or jurisdictional boundaries. It's all about getting across those boundaries and bringing, I think Keith, you said it well, uh, bringing the ability to be surprised by the data uh, in that decision cycle. Because I tell you, I think we're missing incredible opportunities. We have a wealth of information as a society we have a very heavy inability to integrate that information on demand uh, to understand the implications uh, that this data is presenting to us. We're doing better. We're doing better every time we implement a new technology, every time we implement open standards to increase the ability to get there, we're doing better. I want to talk a little bit about, um, from my perspective, you know, I left the government um, 
not because I was unhappy being a civil servant. It was my life. I expected to retire. And my retirement is still in the system, although I think we're borrowing against that right now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, we'll fix that. But uh, I went to the OGC because I felt it was a place where we could get past the work that we have done in creating the infrastructure. You know, the FGDC and its precursors done a marvelous job of creating the discipline of standards, relationships, and policy arrangements to create that infrastructure, the plumbing and the pipes, um, the supply side. And in fact, uh, many of you probably know this, that model that was created here in the US has now gone international. It is recognized as the basis for spatial data infrastructure and sharing from developed to developing nations around the world. And I spend a lot of time in countries like India and in continents in Africa. And these precepts are out there. They're being, they're being used. But I left the government because the focus that I wanted to take was on application, the applied ability of, of uh, information to make better decisions. And I wanted just to take a second and go around the table in the room uh, and talk a little bit about um, how we operate. We're, most people think that we're a technology organization. Uh, so we think, we think of OGC as an industry organization. We are. Um, would you be surprised to know that about 20% of our membership is government? Would you be surprised to know that about another chunk of our membership is academia, research, and not-for-profits? It's a very social process, and it's a process that I think brings the best of government together with industry in a way where they can understand problems in the context of policy decisions, in the context of use cases and problem sets, and try to get industry to align uh, to drive standards that mean something. And that's why, that's why I found uh, the excitement in the OGC. And we have 420 members around the world. Uh, and in this process uh, of OGC, NOAA has been in the process driving open standards for things like sensors, how to publish, discover, access, and integrate sensors quickly. And if you go to NOAA's Ocean Observing System, you'll find that OGC standards are a critical part of bringing together a national network of ocean observation sensors for everything from coastal coastal watershed protection to tsunami warnings and things of that nature. Uh, if you go to NGA, uh, they've been a leader in our process of driving open standards, not just on their behalf, but with the rest of the coalition and their partners around the world in defense and intelligence to create standards that bring together geoint, all source intelligence in a way where it can be brought together quickly and, and uh, consumed and improve decision making. Um, I want to talk a little bit about EPA. Uh, USGS and the other agencies, we have a huge focus right now on geosciences, climate, water, hydrology, ocean monitoring, um, environment. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's not so much in standards development. It has everything to do with developing common best practices that can be shared with, uh, with any EPA, between EPA and USGS, and more importantly, across our borders internationally. And so what we're finding now is that uh, this place-based decision-making is, is lending itself in our process toward collaboration uh, to create national-level best practice on how to use standards to make this data more interoperable across these decision-maker cycles. What tickles me is that his counterpart in Europe, the EEA, is, is just as concerned about creating that common set of standards for hydrology, for instance, as EPA is. So think about the implication of that. The, the ability of standards to unite policy making, not only from the local level, but now cross borders to the international level. That, that's what gets me excited about working in OGC. And, and mind me, I'm not a technical guy. It's all the members that are doing this. The, the governments uh, spend a, a bit of time in our process having a dialogue with industry. Industry gets out of that process the ability to understand where the priorities and the issues are, and that benefits them. And rather than selling system after system in interviews, they're working together to create interfaces that they implement, and which makes it much easier for the government because now it's not just one GIS. It's any spatial technology that uses that standard can be integrated quickly into these government systems. That's, that's the goal. We're not quite 100% there yet, but I think the core framework's in place. Um, and there's a bunch of other issues. The, the one that really uh, tickles me, uh, it's, it's not as implemented as well in the U.S. as it is internationally, but uh, this whole idea of urban models. Think about what the building industry is doing now to move from 2D to 3D, modeling a building in 3D. Extrapolate that now to an urban center and think about the policy implications from the local management level all the way to the federal level and having a complete model of a city to look at safety and security inside and outside of building infrastructure, uh, to look at um, 
line of sight telecommunications placement in an urban setting, to look at logistics and transport, sanitation services. And, and if you're familiar with some of the community policing activities, they're doing this right now. I mean, police are coming together with sanitation, with NGOs, looking at crime patterns, and they're consciously working together, organizationally interoperating, uh, to improve their, their policy positions and how to take care of teens in the afternoon when they're unsupervised. It's really interesting what urban models will do. Uh, almost every major city in Germany is using a standard called, OGC standard called City GML. They're modeling their entire cities in 3D. You can fly it, you can drive it, you can walk into buildings. And they're using that to manage every aspect of that city. So going back to the comments earlier here, you know, what kind of implication does that have to policymakers when you're trying to understand the effectiveness of budget decisions at the federal level and the flow through the states and down to the local? It, it's really interesting the potential that's building here to have location really affect in a much more important and meaningful way the decision process. Um, and, I, and I can go on and on, and I will if you let me. <laughs> Some barriers. Uh, there's been an incredible investment in our process, inter uh, nationally and internationally, in um, getting industry to align on standards and, and to run this process. It's not a big investment when you look at the overall money that's being spent on acquisition and technology, uh, but it's been a significant investment, and it's been leveraged by these 420 members around the world. Um, I think the, in some areas of the world, the policy has actually been implemented for standards and legislation. In Europe, there's a program called Inspire. Countries are mandated to implement open standards when they share location information. It's not an option. And if they don't, they're penalized. Now, that's an extreme, but it works for Europe, and it's being implemented. In the U.S., we have some very um, eloquent and appropriate language at OMB. I think it's A119, uh, which talks about voluntary standards, but it is voluntary. It's, it's, it allows the aid, and I think more focus on how we create a uniform policy, how we create a uniform uh, ability to, to incorporate standards and acquisition policy at the local, at the local agency level, down to the uh, government uh, level, the locals, maybe through grants and other mechanisms, incredibly important. This investment is being reaped uh, over and over again in a number of the agencies that are implementing technologies with our standards. Uh, but I think more can be done if we just try to work on that connection with the acquisition cycle and to do more to mandate. Those mandates, I think, will further incentivize industry to implement those standards and make these products available so they can be plugged in quickly. Um, we had some other questions talked about uh, at the local level, at the federal level. What can we do uh, to engage state and local and federal? I would say pilot. Test a little, build a little, try a little, learn a lot, roll it out. And, and we're seeing that pattern quite a bit here because of the budget limitations, but that is a wonderful way uh, to look at migrating and evolving technology. Uh, we do that in OGC to build standards, uh, and I'm, I'm real happy to see it happening in government as well. Um, some of the challenges, um, we talked a lot about uh, uh, some of the policy challenges, but let me talk a little bit about what we're working on at the next level. What's the uncertainty when you bring all this geospatial information together for a policy decision? You've got data coming in from all different sources, many of them authoritative. It all comes together and it's fused. And Scott, you now have to make a decision based on that information. What is, what, what is the uncertainty of that result that's in front of you? We're working to try to find a transparent way to compute that uncertainty. So when you make a decision, you know how reliable that data result is from all those sources. Semantics. Uh, one man's term is another man's term. Uh, they may not mean the same thing. Just try talking to somebody in the UK, and you'll find within five minutes that uh, semantics uh, has you talking down different directions. We're trying to find ways uh, to deal with semantics. It's human nature to um, label things, have a different vocabulary, and it should be transparent that we can work beyond those vocabularies. And then uh, j just reducing uh, those bad answers, I think, overall. We're doing a lot of things right now to try to tighten up the way we use uh, open standards and technologies and with information to reduce the bad answers with those decision makers. Cost savings, uh, I'll try to close on this one, is um, I have to say that one of the biggest challenges is we don't have enough information on the demand side about the return on investment, and in particular, the repurposing of all this data. So EPA has data, USGS has tremendous sources of data, comes together to another individual for decision making and they, they achieve ROI. Do we think that EPA or USGS knows about that? I doubt it. 
I think we need to do more about understanding the ROI of those decisions and get that information back to those data providers so that they can substantiate continued budget uh, to support and enrich their data sources. I don't think we're doing nearly enough in that area. And we're starting to see some really interesting results, um, tremendous ROI uh, by decision makers in using that repurposed data. Um, our vendors appreciate the interface with government. Uh, they appreciate the interface with industry, and uh, what's nice about it is, is whether or not NGA is pushing a standard or the Taiwanese are pushing a uh, geolocating SMS message, everybody benefits. Um, so I'm pleased to be part of this process, and I think that fundamentally we would not exist today, would not be successful without the policy challenges that are being expressed to us through this government interface. So I thank you all. And I know three of you are members of the OGC and are actively involved, so uh, I appreciate all of your um, efforts. Thank you.